And uh, of course, thank you very much for the invitation. So um, yeah, um, as Thomas already uh, indicated, I'm going to talk to you about uh, ambient seismic noise. But first of all, I want to point out that the work I'm going to show here, of course, is not only mine, but it uh, relies on the work of a lot of students, PhD students, postdocs, and uh, many other colleagues, um, too many to list here, but some of them will appear in the, in the references. So um, as you may have noticed, one of the focus topics of this conference is ambient seismic noise. And um, to most of you, noise will sound like a bad thing. But I want to show you that that is not always the case. So here, what you see on the screen is what most of you will recognize as a seismogram with one very prominent earthquake. But most of the time, you'll see that we don't only record earthquakes, but um, something else that we also that we um, call ambient seismic noise. So this is essentially the background seismic vibrations, which are continuously present. And I will talk about what we can learn about the Earth if we um, listen to this ambient seismic noise. And in particular, I'd like to show you that um, we can use this seismic noise to inform us about the Earth across a wide range of spatial and temporal scales. And during my talk, I'll be slowly filling up this diagram that you see here. But um, I like to start my story here with um, the first sentence of the PhD manuscript of Benno Gutenberg. And seismologists will recognize him as one of the most influential early seismologists. He would go on to determine the structure of the Earth and start describing how earthquakes work. But he started out studying seismic noise. And it starts with a sentence that I copied here, which essentially tells us that um, ever since the first seismometers were installed, seismologists have been aware that besides the earthquakes, there was a continuous presence of background noise. And he found that these um, pulsations, as he called them, have some relationship with ocean waves. So in the first half, half of the last century, of the 20th century, um, a lot of seismologists researched the connection between the seismic noise they observe and the weather of the oceans. And they quickly found out that higher levels of this um, background noise often corresponded to storms over the oceans. And back then, that was one of the only ways to detect these storms. Um, so they actually used that to um, inform themselves about you know, extreme weather systems um, heading in. This went on until about the 1950s or 1960s, uh, by which time there were more airplanes and there were um, weather satellites uh, were starting to um, be used to map the weather over the oceans. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a bit. But first, I want to show you um, what the seismic noise that we're talking about actually looks like. So um, kind of looks like this, like this red. Um, wiggle that you see at the top here. Um, this is just an example of a couple of minutes of seismic noise. Um, if I would show you two weeks of that, it would essentially look like a line. But it becomes clear how much information is contained in here if we look at the spectrogram instead. So this is what you see here. Um, this is a spectrogram for two weeks of noise here on the horizontal axis um, recorded in Hamburg. And um, it shows you what the seismic signal looks like for different frequencies. So that's along the vertical axis. And the color indicates how strong the seismic wave field is for each of those frequencies and at each time. And you can see from this already that there's a lot of structure contained in this continuous signal. So there's a lot of information in there. So of course, the earthquake signals, which you see down here, are uh, the strongest. And um, of course, they're very important to understand. But I'm fascinated by all the other things that we can learn from this. So per perhaps the most obvious pattern is um, up here at the higher frequencies, where you see regular bands of like, stronger and weaker noise. And it follows a day-night cycle. And there's a weekly pattern as well. So um, it yeah, kind of jumps out of you that this is the imprint of uh, human activity. So that causes all kinds of vibrations 
which are then picked up by seismometers. Then down here, there's two bands of stronger noise, which are there continuously. And this, it turns out, is the imprint of the oceans. And what I'd like to tell you um, and show you is that all this information can tell us things about the Earth on various temporal and spatial scales, uh, ranging from the, the global and the very long time scales um, to decades or centuries, um, processes on those time scales, down to the meter and the centimeter scale with processes on the order of uh, minutes or maybe even seconds. And I would like to start filling this diagram by starting with the oceans. So um, like we just saw in the spectrogram, um, there are these two bands. So let's have a slightly closer look at those two bands. Um, you'll see them on any seismometer anywhere on Earth. And in fact, this is the oceans interacting with the Earth crust, um, permanently exciting or generating very faint seismic waves. So um, the first band is usually centered around a period of about 14 seconds, which is the typical period of waves in the open ocean. And then there's, uh, which we call this band the primary microseism, and um, then there's a second band, um, stronger typically, which has a period of around seven seconds. And that's related to the first. So we refer to these two bands as the primary and the secondary microseism. And um, we have a pretty decent idea of how they are generated. So the primary microseism, to start with that, is, um, well, first you need to know that for a body of water that is the size of an ocean, with um, typical wind speeds for you know, the Earth system, you will um, start having ocean surface gravity waves emerging with a central period around 14 seconds. So these ocean surface waves um, move the water um, yeah, with particle motion that is concentrated near the surface, the motion decreases exponentially with depth. So that means that that uh, motion of the water can only interact with the solid um, earth, with the seafloor in very, very shallow areas. So typically at near coastal areas. But when it's able to interact with the solid, solid earth, you will, um, it will essentially push down on the seafloor and generate seismic waves, which also have a period of 14 seconds. So um, we refer to these as the primary microseism. And then, um, like you just saw, we also have um, higher frequency or shorter period um, seismic waves as well. These um, happen whenever two of those um, ocean waves with 14 second period propagate in opposite directions. They can interact nonlinearly, which doubles the frequency and causes a pressure perturbation with a period of seven seconds, sort of a standing wave below that interaction area. And that can reach all the way down to the seafloor, even at kilometers depth. Um, and this vertical pressure perturbation then pushes down on the seafloor and creates seismic waves with um, a period of around seven seconds. So um, these Physical mechanisms were described in the 1950s first and have been um, improved um, yeah, uh, continuously since then. Um, of course, there are still uh, a number of open questions, but I won't go into that into, in this particular talk. What I want to argue here is that, um, yeah, even though the seismologists um, way back in the day understood that there was a relationship between ocean wave and the seismic waves they observe, we now have a much better understanding of the physical mechanisms behind that ocean solid earth interaction. Um, so compared to the studies from the last century, we are now able to use satellite measurements of ocean waves um, and plug that into um, the ocean wave models 
that are based on our understanding of how seismic noise generation works. So um, that's illustrated here. That gives us an idea of where to expect um, regions where lots of seismic noise is generated. Then that can be compared to observations. So um, in contrary to the observations from the 1950s, uh, we now have much better data. We have um, better seismic sensors, um, more seismic sensors. And um, here you see an example of uh, a study by Karina Juracek, where uh, we use several arrays across Europe to determine in um, which direction the main, the main noise sources are acting. So um, yeah, you can see here in these histograms, the direction towards the main noise sources averaged over a year. Um, and this can be, yeah, this typically correlates with areas where there's a lot of this um, wave-wave interaction. So these uh, ocean waves interacting with each other. Of course, um, the reality is a little bit more complicated. The um, directions we find here don't correspond exactly to what the models predict. And um, our observations are now at such a level that we can feed back that information um, back to the oceanographers so that they can improve their ocean wave models and provide us with uh, better estimates. So um, with this, um, we've seen that we can use seismic noise to learn something about how the oceans behave. Um, and I'd like to move to slightly smaller scales now. So um, in particular, I want to uh, highlight a study that we recently did um, together with, uh, uh, in collaboration with Kiel, where we focused on marginal seas instead of the open ocean. So in this case, the North Sea. Um, Smaller bodies of water typically host shorter period ocean waves and therefore also generate um, shorter period um, seismic noise, so higher frequency seismic noise. And um, in this study, um, Dirk Becker actually analyzed seismic data recorded at the island of Helgoland um, in the German part of the North Sea. And here is an example of uh, a spectrogram of the continuous broadband seismic station, um, what that recorded, with again frequency on the vertical axis and about a month and a half um, of time on the horizontal axis. So again, the color, um, brighter yellow color indicates stronger um, noise at those frequencies. So remember that um, at periods of 14 and seven seconds, we had this primary and secondary microseism generated in the, the larger oceans. Um, but since we have shorter period sea waves in the North Sea, those also generate seismic waves with shorter periods. And that's indicated here by the, the red box. So this is the local microseism and it can be, can be detected when we have um, significant wave activity in the North Sea. So here's an example from an ocean uh, model from Wave Watch 3, um, where we see that there is actually um, seismic noise generation in the North Sea area as well as in the North Atlantic. Um, if you would look into the period of the ocean waves in that model, you would also indeed see that the period here uh, corresponds to um, seven second ocean wave periods, which would give us about three seconds um, secondary microseism. So um, that works quite nicely. And um, what is interesting is that the seismic noise associated with those local sea waves, I'm sorry, um, the seismic noise associated with those local sea waves carry a lot of information about the, the uh, wave period of the ocean waves, the direction of propagation, how they interact with the local bathymetry, et cetera. So that um, gives us a lot of incentive to study in detail what's actually going on in these variations of the, the local microseism here. Something else that we um, observe that's very interesting is that the strength of this local microseism is modulated by the tides. And um, 
that's an effect that we don't understand completely yet, but it might indicate a generation mechanism that's linked to tidal currents that possibly interact with the thematic futures. Um, so the fact that we don't really understand this observation yet definitely shows that there's still some open questions in the physical mechanisms of ocean solid earth interaction. So this study um, sort of formed a, a nucleation point for a wider initiative to gain a better understanding of the wave interactions between atmosphere, ocean, and solid earth, and specifically in these marginal seas. And as a preliminary work there, um, driven very strongly by Kiel, um, a multi-parameter network was installed on Helgoland, consisting of seismic and infrasound arrays <coughs> of um, gravimeter and tilt meters. And um, that was installed in 2017 and has been running since. So um, yeah, we believe that we can still learn a lot from the observation of seismic waves generated in the marginal seas. So that would give us information about processes on slightly smaller scales than oceanic scale. Um, right. So what about um, these larger spatial and time scales? So for that, we can have a look at storm systems again, which generate significantly stronger ocean waves and with that stronger seismic noise as well. Um, that seismic noise can be used to track the storms, to track the location of the storm as it evolves. And here is an example of a typhoon in the Pacific, which, um, which was observed by colleagues using uh, a seismic array in California here. So in blue, you see the, the track from meteorological data. Um, so essentially the known track of the storm and then in red is the track that they found by looking at the seismic data, by um, using seismic P waves recorded at the, the collection of sensors here. Another example um, is shown here. This was done by um, Julian, one of my students, um, and it shows a hurricane in the Atlantic. So here we see the um, um, essentially the intensity of the expected noise source from ocean models. Um, and um, he recorded that hurricane at several, using several arrays in North America. And in red, um, you can see the range of directions where uh, he detected surface waves coming from that hurricane. So um, you can see that there's a reasonable match, even though there's a lot of other um, wave activity elsewhere in the North Atlantic. So Julian is presenting a poster about this work in uh, this afternoon, I believe, if you want to find out more. So, okay, these are just storms that happen once in a while. How can that help us gain information about long time skills? So, for that, we need to step back a little bit um, and realize that we know, yeah, how the weather over the ocean affects ocean waves. And we have a pretty good idea how this in turn generates um, ambient seismic noise. And as we've seen, our understanding of the physical processes has improved and improves continually. So we can use the storm events to establish essentially something like a fingerprint of what a storm sounds like when it's heard by seismometers. Um, so if we're able to um, quantify how the coupling between atmosphere, ocean, and solid earth works in this way, we could also think about making it work the other way around. So um, turning these arrows around essentially. So as an input, we could use um, the thousands of old analog seismograms in several archives across Germany and also worldwide. Um, these are seismograms that were recorded by old seismographs, partially dating back to the start of the 20th century. So with that, we could um, potentially use old seismic records to improve the uh, records or statistics 
of the number of storms or hurricanes that occurred in the past century. And that would be very valuable for um, climate scientists. So of course, in this, there are still a lot of challenges to face uh, before we will be able to do this, but I think we're steadily moving towards this goal. So um, up to now, we've seen that by listening to ambient seismic noise, we can already find out quite a lot about processes that happen above the Earth's surface. And in the next part, I'd like to, let, to look um, below the Earth's surface. And for that, um, we're going to need to extract a different kind of signal from the seismic noise. In order to do that, um, we're going to use a method called ambient noise interferometry, which um, sort of came onto the stage a bit more than a decade ago, and um, yeah, essentially revolutionized uh, the way seismologists work. So how does this um, ambient noise interferometry work? Um, so first of all, let's step back and consider what we try to do in seismology. So in seismology, we typically um, look at earthquake signals. And why is that? It's because these signals can tell us something about the way an earthquake ruptured, about the way that the subsequent seismic waves traveled through the Earth. And um, what you essentially do is you have um, some kind of source, let's say an earthquake that happens at point A, and you record it at point B. And assume that your source is um, something like a very simple delta pulse or an impulsive source. And the signal that you record in B will um, look something like this. So the shape of each of these wiggles tells you something about the different wave speeds that the wave encountered on its path. And um, it tells you about the elastic properties of the subsurface, whether it's hard or soft, uh, whether it's homogeneous or not. The problem with this is that you need some kind of source, so earthquakes or some source that you can generate yourself. And um, that is, of course, not always present. And what is always present, seismic noise. So um, that's why we use this noise interferometry. The way that works is a bit technical, but the main point is that if you now have two sensors, two receivers at locations A and B, you can record the noise. Um, and sorry, and these receivers, uh, these sensors are surrounded by noise sources you can record the um, seismic noise that both of these sensors record at any time. So the signals themselves won't look like much, but if you take a long enough time of the signal and cross-correlate between those two sensors, what you end up with is a cross-correlation signal that whose shape will look very much like um, the seismogram that you would expect for um, a source that was in location B that was recorded, uh, sorry, a source that was location A that was recorded at, lo at location B. Um, so it simply said um, one side of the signal will look like there was an earthquake at station A that was recorded at B, and the other side looks as if you had an earthquake at um, location B that was recorded at location A. So in a way, using only records of seismic noise, we can create or extract um, something similar to seismograms from our data. And then we can use those to look at what's happening inside the Earth. So in recent years, this method has essentially been embraced by a large part of the seismological community. And there's been hundreds or even thousands, I guess, of publications using this by now. Um, so we can use seismic noise to illuminate the interior of the Earth and determine the structure. So I'll, I'll put that sort of um, scale indicator up here. Uh, since the Earth structure doesn't change very quickly, um, and in the following slides, I'll show you just uh, three examples to illustrate that we can determine Earth structure across um, this range of spatial scales. So first, um, we have a study that used uh, the very long period seismic waves 
to uh, investigate global structure. So from the crust down into the mantle. And um, here's just one example of their results where you can see um, faster S wave speeds below the continents. Um, so next on a more regional scale, uh, I picked a study where the authors use the ALP array, which is an um, international effort to deploy a dense network of seismometers covering the Alps. And here is an impression of the uh, depth of the MOHO discontinuity below the Alps. So this is imaged with um, ambient seismic noise. And finally, on a um, very small scale or local scale, of, this is about um, 10 by 15 kilometers, um, an area below um, the Ecofisk uh, oil field that was uh, again imaged using ambient seismic noise. And um, for example, here the red color corresponds to um, sort of densified sediments uh, that correspond to production of uh, production induced subsidence. So extremely quickly, these three examples by no in no way um, cover what has been done. There's been uh, hundreds of such studies covering all kinds of locations and scales. But um, I just wanted to show you that we can go from essentially the kilometer scale to the global scale with this. So these examples assume that the Earth structure is static. But what about cases where the structure changes over time? Well, that's uh, another example of seismic noise. Um, it's always there. It's always present. So um, we can use it to investigate changes in structure. Um, so, OK. Remember that these wiggles, essentially, that we can extract from the noise represent um, the material that the seismic waves have passed through. So if that material changes over time, we can detect those changes with these signals. So um, essentially, we, what we can do is we can extract these signals from our noise and then um, repeat that a couple of times. So we can hear in very basic example, um, we can do it for one month and then compare it to the signal that we extract the next month. So if the material that these waves have passed through has changed in between, um, we would be able to measure that by comparing these two signals. So for example, in this case, if the seismic wave speed of the material has um, increased, if we have a faster seismic wave speed, the whole signal will look a little bit um, compressed. Um, OK, that's super basic explanation, but I want to illustrate the kind of measurements that we can do with um, this type of monitoring method. Um, and for that, I'd like to highlight a recent study that we did in Hamburg, where the aim was to track changes in material properties in the urban subsurface. So on the outskirts of Hamburg, um, we set up three seismometers in the field. And right next to them, um, but here is a, a weather station and a measurement set up from the Institute of Soil Science in Hamburg, where they measure groundwater level, soil mo moisture content, um, soil temperature, and a couple of different things. Um, that provides us with the grand truth of what's actually going on in the soil. Next to the field where our seismometers are, we have um, a highway, um, we have a railroad, and we have a patch where um, essentially uh, people are digging gravel. And um, all of this produces a lot of vibrations um, and a lot of seismic background noise. So to a normal seismometer, this location would be a nightmare. But uh, we want to uh, use this seismic noise to illuminate the um, subsurface here. So um, we did that. The, the goal of the project was uh, to see if we can monitor uh, water content or soil moisture content and the effect of um, rain on the near sur surface. But uh, what we found instead is that we um, can actually monitor um, how much the soil is, is frozen. 
so what we did is we extracted um, signals by using this ambient noise interferometry with a time resolution of two hours. And then on those signals, which we extracted repeatedly, we measured uh, seismic wave speed changes. And finally, um, for the seismometers here, um, since seismometers record um, three components of motion here, we focus on um, the horizontal components, which uh, yeah, contain mainly love waves and shear waves. So um, here's our results. So first of all, I'm plotting the temperature measured in the ground by the, the soil science um, um, station. And um, in the yeah, lighter dotted line, you can see what the temperature evolution is at 80 centimeters depth. And the dashed line shows you what happens at five centimeters depth. And what you can see here is um, that um, yeah, over the period um, of a couple of months, you have a temperature evolution. But here in winter, um, the temperature approaches very closely to zero. Um, on top of it now, I'm plotting what happens at the surface with the temperature. And you can see that at the surface, there are um, a couple of times where the temperature dips below zero. So those, are, those times are integrated with the, the gray bars here. So what you can see is that the surface actually froze, but um, the five centimeter um, measurement point never dipped below zero. So that means that we have a frozen layer that is five centimeters or less. Now, um, what did we get with our seismic measurements? That will be overlaid now with the red line. So this is the change in seismic wave speed um, and you can see that at the times where the surface of the soil, so that we had a thin ice layer, the seismic wave speed increases um, dramatically. What's interesting to note here is that um, we're using frequencies where the wavelength of our seismic waves is um, of the order of tens of meters. And even with those long wavelengths, we are still able to detect uh, an ice layer that is um, yeah, a couple of centimeters thin. Um, this is pretty surprising. So we checked with a simple numerical test. And um, I'm not going to show the results here. If you're interested, I can show them afterwards. But um, essentially, the results that we see here fit with um, what the numerical test would, would lead us to expect. Um, so to summarize that, uh, we were able to use the seismic noise from um, the urban sources to track very small variations in seismic wave speed. And um, in particular, the shear waves turn out to be quite sensitive to frozen soil with a surprisingly high sensitivity even to very thin layers of ice, so much smaller than one wavelength. So this could be potentially very interesting for um, permafrost monitoring, for example. Um, so that would be an application area to, to explore. So, okay, that gives us the first example of studies where we can use the seismic noise to monitor changes associated to processes taking place below the surface. Um, I want to again quickly show a few examples of other studies that have looked at different temporal and spatial skills. So um, in particular, um, we can use these methods to investigate changes in the crust or associated with fault zones or with the volcanoes. And here we have one example of the Piton de la Fournaise on uh, Ile de la Réunion, where um, an Obermann and co-authors went uh, beyond detecting just um, seismic wave speed changes, and they detected um, very slight changes in structure of the volcano. So one of these red areas here corresponds um, to an ongoing eruption um, whereas the other one um, is associated with uh, an eruption which would only start a few days later. So um, again, these, these kind of um, setups can be used to um, design monitoring systems. Um, if we go back to the approximate scale we were, where we were earlier uh, with monitoring the top tens of meters of subsurface, um, I'd like to show you an example of uh, a landslide. 
in Peru, where um, right after a local earthquake, um, we, uh, well, they <laughs> detect a sharp decrease in um, seismic wave speed here. Um, that's probably associated with the weakening of the, the landslide material. And it was followed by the onset of um, the landslide displacement. So again, this illustrates that these measurements could be used to set up um, monitoring systems. So although the red circle here um, now says landslides, similar observations have been reported for, for rock falls, for dams, dikes, um, glaciers, which uh, essentially led to um, the community coining the term um, the, something that we're calling environmental seismology, uh, meaning that we can monitor um, yeah, changes associated with, um, yeah, I guess, envir environmental processes. Um, and lastly, at the very small scale, we're starting to apply these methods for structural health monitoring, so to monitor changes in buildings. And there, um, again, one short example of a study that we're doing in collaboration with BAM, with the Federal Institute for Materials uh, Research and Testing in Berlin. And together with one of our master students and a postdoc at BAM, we're using their uh, BLIBE structure, sorry. Um, this is a bridge-like test structure, which um, consists of pretensioned concrete. And the pretensioning of the structure can be varied. So what we did is we used the um, ambient seismic noise to measure seismic wave speed changes as the tension of that structure was slowly released. And ooh, come on, there you go. And what we saw is that the um, seismic wave speed um, decreases as the tension on the, this bridge-like structure is slowly released. So with decreasing stress. So um, the observations there are probably associated with the stress changes and eventually with um, small cracks forming in the material. This is still ongoing work. Um, so with that, I've given only a handful of examples of the hundreds of stu studies that use um, ambient noise to monitor changes in the subsurface. And um, I hope with this that I've been able to show you that we can cover processes over a large range of spatial and temporal scales simply by exploiting the information that's contained in ambient seismic noise. So this can help us to look inside the earth and as you recall, um, also look at interactions between the solid earth and the ocean and atmosphere. Now, um, I'd like to finish with a very quick look forward to what the future is going to bring us. And um, what we're currently seeing is a very rapid development in seismic instrumentation. So for example, um, we're seeing the emergence of what we call large end arrays, um, which are very dense deployments of um, relatively inexpensive seismic sensors, um, where you put the sensors together on yeah, um, several sensors per wavelength, essentially. And here's an example um, by um, work by my postdoc, Sven Schipkos, who um, recorded the ambient seismic blah, field um, using a large N deployment in the Vienna Basin. Um, so what you can see is that you get information about the seismic wave field in, in really high uh, spatial detail. Another pretty exciting development over the past couple of years is the use of um, telecommunication fibers, so-called um, distributed acoustic sensing, where uh, we can essentially turn um, unused telecommunication fibers into seismic sensors with extremely high spatial resolution. So essentially you can get one seismic um, sensor point, one seismic measurement point every four to 10 meters or so along a fiber. And this can be um, used on telecommunication fibers that are installed anyway, which are not being used. And here is an example from um, the group at uh, GFZ where um, they used uh, a fiber along a road, I believe it is, 
uh, in Iceland. Um, and what, what is shown in the animation here is essentially the um, ocean noise. So the, the, these 15 second um, ocean generated seismic waves, which are passing along the fiber one by one. And you can already see that, well, even though there's sort of a, a pattern of high and low amplitudes, there's a, a lot of detail in there as well, which um, shows us that there's, uh, yeah, again, lots of information there to extract about uh, the heterogeneity of the, the seismic wave field there. Um, and finally, another type of um, seismic instrumentation driven development is that we're moving towards measuring really the full motion of the wave field. This means uh, moving away from simply um, relying on the, the three components of motion that traditional seismometers record, so up, down, north, south, and east, west, but also including the, the rotation motions. Um, so with that, including three additional degrees of freedom and uh, yeah, better recording the, the full seismic wave field, so the full range of motion. And again, that gives us uh, additional information um, about the seismic wave field and with that about what that seismic wave field has seen and what generated it. So all this leads us to um, essentially measure the seismic wave field in more spatial detail and it increases our sensitivity to, to complex structures and changes in those complex structures. So what that's doing is essentially helping us fill in this um, yeah, small scale, um, short spatial scale portion of our, our scale diagram. Um, and to end this, I'd like to um, use this occasion to introduce a new ITN, a new um, innovative training network that started um, on Monday, actually, um, where we will uh, integrate these um, types of uh, emerging ground motion sensor technology into our day-to-day -day seismological practice. The um, work I've presented here will also uh, be a component of, of this uh, research uh, since we're going to look at the effect of small-scale structural changes on uh, the seismic wave field, and we're going to use that to improve um, our monitoring of geohazards. Um, most of all, this is a training network, which means that we're going to uh, recruit 15 PhD students and offer them uh, um, yeah, a very interesting, hopefully, training program around these topics. So uh, recruitment is um, ongoing at the moment. So if you are a master student interested in this, or if you know um, excellent master students, please point them our way. Um, you can find out more on our website or if you're modern, <laughs> you can uh, follow us on Twitter as well. So with that, um, I hope I convinced you to listen to the noise. And um, I've shown you that um, ambient seismic noise actually surrounds us continuously as it's generated by um, the ocean's uh, meteorological phenomena, geophysical processes, and even us humans. Um, the noise carries the imprint of Earth's properties, and that can be used to extract information about those um, properties across time and spatial scales. Um, and it can teach us about Earth processes, Earth structure, and changes in that structure. So with that, thank you very much. And I'll leave you with a conclusion slide.